What's up, everyone? Atlanta is back with a third season after four years of waiting, and they came back with two episodes in the same night, and they were absolute bangers. I was really wondering how they would come back because, as we know from last season, the gang was off to Europe for Paperboy's tour. So I was like, hmm, are they going to do a whole season of Atlanta in European countries? I mean, I'm all for that. I just think it's a perfect setting for the gang to get into some crazy antics this season. But also the namesake is Atlanta. So by keeping with that namesake, they opened this first episode, the season premiere, with an episode called Three Slaps. The episode takes place completely based in Atlanta and actually does not feature any of the main cast, which is always something I loved about the show. They have set up the world of Atlanta to be this surreal wonderland where the main cast isn't exactly needed or more importantly, the real main cast member of the show is the actual city of Atlanta itself and its surreal wonderland qualities. And this season turns that up to 11. We start the episode off with two guys night fishing on a lake under a bridge. One guy's white and one guy's black. The black guy wants to get going because he's getting kind of freaked out and admits that he almost drowned in the lake when he was a kid. Um, and then he, they start discussing about how the lake could be haunted because apparently there's a whole town at the bottom of the lake that was drowned out when a dam was built causing the formation of the lake um the white guy gets all creepy and tells the black guy that he almost drowned because there's a lot of souls at the bottom of the lake waiting to pull him down and then you know the black guy then gets pulled down into the water and it, it's kind of freaky but it's also like kind of like i don't know maybe it's just a reaction is just kind of weird to me but <laughs> Uh, we then find out that we are actually watching the dream of a kid dozing off in class. So all of those events, you know, that conversation, the whole creepy events was just this kid's nightmare while he's just, you know, taking a, a nod off in class. But here's the thing. It's not just a dream. The haunted lake is real. The lake is most likely based on Lake Lanier in Georgia. Um, and it was constructed in 1950, but prior to that, it actually was the, you know, the home of a lot of people. There's a lot of towns that were built up and there was one town called Oscarville that was a predominantly black community, um, but also the site of a lot of racial tension that caused, you know, a lot of people to be displaced from their homes. Um, a lot of indigenous people, a lot of Native American people are also displaced. There may be a lot of cemeteries and burial grounds there then were kind of drowned out by a dam being built and the lake being uh, created, the reservoir being filled up. But Lake Lanier seems to just be cursed overall. Since 1994, 200 people have died in the lake, with like 40 of those people have died and were just never found. And one of the local legends also states that back in 1950, uh, two women driving their car kind of craned off of a bridge into the lake. And one of the women is called the Lady of the Lake. It is a ghost that wanders the bridge at night in a blue dress and is lost and restless. And I think you should remember that, that part about the... Uh, to women, you know, careening off of the bridge. This is all just a dream that uh, our actual main episode protagonist is having in class, Laquarius. Uh, we continue the episode with Clarius, Laquarius waking up from his creepy dream in class. He starts getting hype and acting up because his teacher says that they are going on a field trip to see Black Panther 2, which, you know also raises some questions about the Atlanta universe. Like, they got Black Panther 2 already? Is, is Chadwick still alive? Is Chadwick still alive in the Atlanta universe? I hope he is. Um, but... Laquarius gets sent to the principal's office for acting up and his mom and grandfather show up and his mom makes him dance for his life because he was dancing in class. So his mom's logic is like, oh, you got to dance for your life now. And his grandfather offers up some, you know, swift corporal punishment. What's your problem? Which was just so hilarious and weird and out of left field. Like the slaps sound like a wet fish like there's <laughs> just the weakest little slaps but the guidance counselor witnesses this and vows to get him out of that you know terrible situation like really on some white savior shit and the next morning cpp shows up at his house for a wellness check his mom ain't having that shit and just let them have him like he, they she just kicks him out like already has some of the stuff in a garbage bag and throws him out which was just like 
weird as shit in my opinion like i just don't know what they were really like is commenting on with that scene with the mom i i just don't really get that part but uh cpp sends him to a new foster home where he has two white moms that already have adopted three black children and immediately there are strong get out vibes coming off of these two in fact like one of the moms is played by jamie newman uh jamie newman who was also in Lovecraft Country. Uh, She played the despicable white lady trope in that too. So I already knew what was up when I saw her. I I, I really wonder how actors feel. I really wonder how actors feel about playing characters like that. Like obviously Jamie is not racist and is a great actress, but how does it feel to be like to be the despicable white lady like every time like damn i gotta play a piece of shit again like your agent calls you and you're like oh man i got the perfect role for you and you're like racist white lady how'd you know but anyway look new setup is so weird like they only eat one bland ass maybe even raw chicken leg for dinner the house smells like crap because they make their own kombucha and they even got their kids working in the garden talking about how they should sing a song while you work like some old ass slave hymnals and shit like it's just so crazy out of left field that sing something silly like um i don't wanna work no more <laughs> after work is done or whatever they're working in the garden they all go to the farmer's market to sell their stuff and when laquarius spots a police officer he begs to go home like he runs to the police officer he's like please you know this this shit sucks like whoa shit i almost shot you I but obviously he gets out charmed by the two white ladies uh and when they get home like he the one mom is actually like calling him a snitch and shit and when finally a black social worker shows up to do a wellness check on them and immediately notices that something is weird. It's like all fishy, right? But white mom ain't having that and decides to have a talk, a a, a talk with the lady uh, herself. And we just never see that lady again. So with Laquarius's like last hope kind of gone he finally starts to eat the chicken he's getting adjusted to it or whatever he eats the chicken and immediately starts having weird fever dreams and getting sick the next morning the moms tell him to get into the car because they are going to the grand canyon and aquarius is like yeah that's bullshit like where are we going for real because you know What the fuck do you mean the Grand Canyon from Atlanta? That's 26 hours of driving. Fuck off. Like, I'm no, like, at least tell me we are going to Disney World or something, you know, like something that a kid would actually be excited about, uh, you know, having to get into the car about. But I don't know. Or even something that's closer. While they're loading up the car, Laquarius spots the social worker's clipboard by the trash can next to a very human shaped body looking, you know, body bag like a a a garbage bag that definitely has a human body in it so yeah like the social worker is dead i don't know this scene was kind of like that shot is just kind of funny because like i understand the direction style but like yeah you're really just going to leave the person's notepad atop of their body like a a body shaped garbage bag with that person's notepad on top of it like they just these these ladies really need to brush up on their murder game or or something but uh anyway they are on the way to the grand canyon in quotes the fucking yeah the grand canyon sure and laquarius has the uh like this non-verbal communication with all the other kids in the back of the van and kind of starts formulating a plot I feel like, and the moms stop to let their dog get out of the car and psych themselves up to do the unthinkable. And when they get back in, they crank the music and drive off the bridge into the haunted lake. Right before the crash, one of the moms realizes that the kids are no longer sleeping in the back and they did the old pillow in the sleeping bag trick, like... You know, the, 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 just the classic kids move. And Laquarius hops out of the back door like the fucking Chad that he is. And the moms drive off the bridge to their deaths alone. And my, you know, my man just walks back home where his mom welcomes his back and back like, oh, you, you're, you're finally back. And I'm like, you 
just let them like it was so weird like you just let the uh, the services have him he didn't even want to go like everything was fine in your household like i just don't understand why i just don't get the direction that they were going for that character it's just really weird and you know loquarius eats a spaghetti uh watching the morning news report about the car crash on tv we then realized that that all of that was just Ern's dream he was having in europe and then the episode ends so yeah they did like an inception dream within a dream type of thing on this episode but here's the thing it's not a dream this is all based on a true story and the outcome is a lot more grim and terrible so Laquarius' story is just very familiar. Like, I didn't catch it on the first time. I think maybe a lot of other people uh, would have. But it actually borrows from the real story of Devante Hart and his five foster siblings. A, a group of black children in foster care who were killed by their adoptive white mothers, Jennifer and Sarah Hart, in 2018. And it was a murder-suicide, and it happened in California after years of abuse and relocating through the West Coast, all through, like, California. Uh, you know, these uh, these two moms, like, just killed their adoptive, they just killed their adoptive children, right? And he is, Devante Hart in particular, is presumed dead, but his body was actually never recovered or found. So, like, yeah, this is, it, it's completely crazy. This is something I did not pick up on on my first watch and had to look into it. But without a doubt, this is the tragic event that the writers are calling back to. And it really puts a pit in your stomach. Like, the second time I watched it, knowing that information, it just felt really, really crazy. Um, even though, like, the actual story took place in California, the scene at the farmer's market, you know, completely confirms the direction they were going with. Like, as you can see, uh, the similarities, I'll be throwing that up, uh, the similarities between, you know, Laquarius and uh, Devante Hart, you know, with that free hugs thing. Uh, the billboard, the, you know, the free hugs uh, uh, poster and shit. It, it's just really like the the hat and everything. Like you know, the costume design is completely based off of Devonte Hart in these photos here. Um, and it's just so sad. Uh, but you know, this is the mind blowing episode. With all of that in context, when you look at like how the episode is structured, it is like this, like terrible grim episode but also has this uh, horror aspect to it that you know was like th the twilight zone a bit so there are many questions that this brings up for the atlanta universe did these events actually happen in their universe and will it be reflected in later seasons or was this kind of just like an inception level dream sequence and it's not really going to do anything but lead back to Ern having this dream. I kind of want to know if this will maybe even subconsciously affect his character and his decisions uh, moving forward in the episode. If there will be any callbacks to this dream or something. Um, it didn't do so in the uh, episode two that's already out. But it, uh, tell me what you guys think. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I know there's another episode available to do uh, a video breakdown on and they should be coming out weekly. So let me know. If y'all think I should keep this up, uh, like and subscribe, and I promise to take the class to Black Panther 2.